The West, a frontier full of possibilities. You hit the open road with your friends, searching for a new life, some fun, intoxicated with the promise of exciting new opportunities. The land where your dreams can become a reality. But what if you take the wrong turn? Instead of traveling along the path to your dreams, you journey down a road into your worst nightmares. A feverish nightmare. The place you thought would bring you such joy has turned the very concepts of society upside down. Nothing you see will bring you comfort, and the universe is working against you. There is nowhere to hide, and the sound of a cycling chainsaw blade echoes over the horizon. This is It Records. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the It Records podcast. I'm Matt Johnson, one of your hosts, and I'm joined with our other hosts, as always, Peter and Lindsay. Thanks, Matt. I was not expecting that whistle at all. That's our live audience. <laughs> There's a, whi- mm-hmm. a whistle sign instead of like an applause. <laughs> yeah, we're changing it up a little bit instead of clapping. Uh, well, this week, everybody, we watched the 1974 um, horror classic Texas Chainsaw Massacre, directed by the late, great Toby Hooper. Rest in peace, Toby. What happened was true. (laughs) The most bizarre and brutal series of crimes in America. Just as real. Just as close. Just as terrifying as being there. Even if one of them survives, what will be left? The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. After you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. Yeah, so this is a favorite of mine. I picked it this week, letting the listeners know. Have you guys seen this before? The original one, 74? Yes. Yeah, we watched it. I'd never seen it before, but we watched it in that horror movie class a few years ago. So, uh, yeah, it was nice to give this a rewatch. Yeah, you guys took it without me. You know, I don't feel jealous at all. Yeah, well, that's what happens when you don't minor in cinema studies, Pete. (laughs) I didn't have yeah. time to minor because I fucked up my first two years of college. Oh, well. <laughs> well, well, there well. You yeah, you didn't. I believe you were even surprised when you heard that the horror film class was offered. Yes, I you were su- didn't know it existed. I was pretty pissed off. That would have been perfect for you. Yeah. A class just to watch and dissect horror mm-hmm. films. That's kind of what we do on this podcast. Yeah. Like I, I would say it's verbatim. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost exactly that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, th- for those of you who haven't seen this movie or, or heard of it, Get Out From Under of Your Rock. It's kind of a, an iconic movie in horror. It's Leatherface. I'm sure you've heard of him, the chainsaw-wielding villain. Um, but this one came out in 74. And if you're unfamiliar, um, I'll give you a quick rundown of the the original movie. Um, Two siblings, uh, Sally and Franklin, they visit their grandfather's grave along with some of their friends in Texas. And they're attacked by a family of cannibalistic psychopaths. So before we sort of break down the plot and give our general feelings of what we thought about the movie and the styles, um, I will 
give my horror significance rant later on in this episode. I'm going to try to stick to that again. This I did that at the beginning when we started this podcast, but I'm going to try to keep to it and give how this influenced the genre um, and why it still holds up as a classic, in my opinion, at least. Mm-hmm. Well, I almost feel like we could almost... Unless you want to talk about the plot right now, we could jump into the horror significance, because I think... Um, I got a few things to say about it, and I'm sure Lindsay could share a few things. About the significance? Yeah. Sure, yeah. We could do that. Fire then... away. Well, I, I, I figured that Matt's going to hit the point of it being the first slasher, I believe. Um, mm-hmm. It came out the same year as Black Christmas, mm-hmm. but I think it even predates Black Christmas, if I remember that correctly. October yeah, that would make sense. Was this one, yeah. And then Black Christmas was Christmas time? Yeah, was that? Say, I believe it was Christmas Day. December. Christmas Day? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, they definitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, America beats Canada again. <laughs> <laughs> I think, like, the only one besides. And this is just based on my research, but the only one besides uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre would be Psycho. Yeah. But, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's basically the first of its kind. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Psycho is definitely a di- is I would say a different breed. It definitely influenced the slasher for sure, but it like kind of falls into thriller. Mm. Even though we've talked about how thrillers is horror to us, right? Um, but I don't know for sp- specific subgenre of horror. I don't know where I would put it. True, because it predates slasher, mm-hmm. and it's not a, a giallo, which also predates slasher. Yeah. Because that's basically a slasher, just an Italian movie. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I would argue, like what Lindsay was saying, um, that Psycho kind of has those slasher tendencies. But I think mm-hmm. what like we're more familiar with now, if you think of it as like uh, like a Halloween or Friday the 13th, those kind of slashers, this is the first of its kind with like the faceless, soundless vict- uh, killer. Like you never really see their face, they never really talk. That stalking sort of presence. Mm. Um, yeah. Where Psycho has those elements, but it's more it's more of like a mystery almost still. Um, with because you see Norman Bates, and there's also that uh, that uh, conclusion element, like oh, Norman Bates was caught, and this is why he did it. I feel like also with Texas Chainsaw Massacre, they took it the first step where like there is no real conclusion at the end of it. You don't feel that wave of like oh, thank God he's dead or arrested or something that's you true. don't get that old hollywood moment yeah yeah mm-hmm. definitely or like psycho was like what 1960 yeah like 14 years before this mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. and a parallel between those there's a few but ed gein was the actual real life serial killer that psycho is based off of um and that's also what toby hooper took the inspiration for leatherface mm-hmm. in texas yeah. chainsaw massacre with the, uh, you know, lampshades made of skin and the skulls and the bones in the house. He influenced so many horror icons. It's, I think, like, didn't, like, elements of, like, almost every single icon of horror is, like, influenced by Ed Gein in some way. Mm-hmm. Isn't that yeah. true? Sure I think, yeah, like, like a lot of the first slashers like this were, yeah, like, around the 70s and so... Like late sixties and seventies were all inspired by that. Yeah, and in uh, in... no, wait, were you in a sec? Oh, I was just gonna go on about the slasher tropes in with the idea of the last female. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and the final girl. That's I mean prevalent in this in this movie with Sally being the last one of the the five of them. I believe it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it like it, even though like. It had no structure to follow, but, like, it's, like, you think, because, like, Black Christmas, when we, I know we haven't watched this on the podcast, but, like, the structure, I would say, is different from, like, a usual slasher where Texas Chainsaw, if you were, you know, taking it from our eyes in modern times, that it, like, kind of, like, follows it to a T, when there was no like pre-existing formula, does that make sense? Um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you're saying? Kind of like how like like the rules of like of like who's gonna die. I mean, right. there's w- there, nothing predated it. Yeah, like mm-hmm. I mean, you, I guess you had like 
he kind of had like, like I said, with like how Giallo kind of predated Slash and really paved a way. Like after Psycho, it kind of took it to the extreme with like more like fucked up killers, kind of mm-hmm. like, and it took away and like they still had that mystery angle, but they really focused on like the sadistic nature of the killer, mm-hmm. which is like how Slasher took that even more. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, like, added gore eventually, but the Texas Chainsaw doesn't have too much gore in it. Yeah. It's, like, only, it's only, like, two or three scenes at the end. Like, near the end. Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting point, because I feel like when people watch this, they see it's, like... I was even reading Roger Ebert's review, and he's like, oh, this is, like, a gore, gory, gross movie. But I think it's just the way it's filmed, and, like, the interactions with the Leatherface family. Mm-hmm. Because there's actually not a lot of blood... And Toby Hooper was going for a PG rating. Yeah, that's um, <laughs> surprising <laughs> to me given the final cut, but, you know, okay. Did he get yeah. a PG rating for that? You know, I, don't, he I did. actually don't. No, okay, it was, I was Yeah, I was just like, there's, I was like, there's no way. Yeah. Because, like, it's, it's really jarring the way it's cut. Like, I forgot, like, it's been a two or three years since I watched it last, and you were like this, Matt. My copy is from the movie fan. The good old uh, movie uh, rental store at ISU that is now closed. Mm-hmm. So I got bought it, like, it. The closing sale? I did. Oh, nice. Saw the Very special nice. edition on DVD. Mm-hmm. And I forgot how dark the film is. Like, It's like the night scenes are very hard to see. Yeah. Because like, this, the camera they probably use is, is like, it's a super low budget movie. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. It's 3, 300000 I think, yeah. Really? Is the budget. That was the final budget I saw, but I, I did a lot of research into this film, and it was originally just 60000 Yeah. was what they started with. And then one of their friends, they asked to start, a, like, a production company, and he did. And, like, they ended up, like, selling pieces of their royalties of the movie to fund the movie. Oh, for man. People. So, Does like, once have... it made so much money, they wouldn't make, yeah, but they had to, they needed money, I guess. Mm-hmm. So they probably didn't make a lot of movie, a lot of money off the movie then, since they sold the royalties and it made a good amount of money, yeah. <laughs> especially for yeah. back then. Yeah, thirty million, I think, is what I read, which was a lot back then, right? Yeah, it seems right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know they shot. I think it was sixteen millimeter. They said they shot on for this, which is pretty neat. Well, I guess it was seventy four, so. Mm. It's kind of stand, standard more back then compared to now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think anything's shot in 16 millimeter anymore. No, unless you're like Christopher Nolan or Tarantino, and you have the clout to get 35 millimeters in theaters still. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that I noticed is that, like, oh, back to, like, the way it was cut, especially, like, I know we're jumping ahead here, but each, like, character is kind of like um pretty gruesomely taken out like by leatherface mm-hmm. and it's it's weird because like the music almost doesn't set you up for it which in most horror movies today do like it just kind of like happens and i don't know yeah. if that is so that I, it, it could either be scarier because you're just like the music doesn't set you up for it at all or you just like you're it's so fast that you can't even catch it but it's like i think it's still jarring and like the way that and it's like so fastly paced when that when the gruesome stuff happens and happens it's like really it's like really interesting that especially when she gets captured it's like more noticeable like how it's like really closed up into like her facial expressions of like how horrified she is by this cannibalistic family mhm mhm yeah i I really like that element of it, especially one of the, I think one of the best death scenes, if you will, is the first guy, Kirk, I think guy, Kirk, um, when they go into the house and the Leatherface house and he walks through that hallway and he gets hit with the mallet and it's really, there's no jump, there's no real music cue except Leatherface, the first time we see him comes out of the hallway and he starts convulsing and I, mm-hmm. some of those I f- were scarier because and what Hooper was trying to do is make it seem as realistic as possible in the sense of, like, um, even in open spaces, like, 
you're you're not safe in these like familiar spaces you're not safe and he's not going to try to heighten it more than like how scary it actually be like uh, that makes sense well even like the way if you remember the opening like how they had like someone like reading out like what like the t- um the kind of like not like the title card the, but like it was like the a, crawl the crawl yeah and it was like it almost makes it seem like it's a, in a real event like that actually happened like they like they really play like oh it could like if you said based on true events people would have believed it because like the way that they kind of introduced it kind of had you feel that way and the one thing that I the one of the only things I actually wrote down for the movie because I've seen this movie a lot was that it referred to her brother like Sally's brother as invalid brother and I was like wait what what did you yeah. just say <laughs> like I was yeah. like like I was actually pretty shocked by that because I was like wow like. I know it's the seventies, but come on. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Franklin's in a wheelchair. For yeah, viewers who haven't seen this, listeners who haven't seen this, that's her brother. They yeah. really make him pretty useless, and I hate to say that, but he's just like he's very childish and yeah, very whiny. Yeah, he's always and just, just like, like pissed off. But he's like, like <laughs> I can't. He's like, <laughs> like when he's like mad, I'm just like, okay, you're like twenty like seven years old right now what are you doing <laughs> mm-hmm. fair enough yeah. hey, apparently when he was doing that stuff uh hooper said he was trying to uh p.s I, I watched the commentary with toby hooper and gunner hansen um he was trying to parallel him with the hitchhiker they pick up because mm. the hitchhiker is like spitting like that at their car and everything when they kick him out and doing those gestures and he was trying to parallel him with uh franklin Oh, within within their friend group, like because the hitchhiker within his family group, or whatever, and they're trying to parallel. They were the same kind of role. They were they were seen the same way. Like the rejects of the of the group. Yep. Wow. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, so they kind of give it like more of a re- okay. At least it's better than making it like here's this wheelchair guy. Let's make him pretty useless and not do anything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Now that makes a lot of sense. Mm-hmm. I would like, I mean, even though they did make him out like, um, like he didn't do much in the movie. A- at least he was like one one of the final people. Like he was pretty close. He got he got really he got close. Uh, yeah, one and, of the like, final two. And like that, like I remember when I first saw, I did not expect that at all. Like when he came in with the chainsaw and got Franklin, I was like, oh shit! That, that, yeah. I did not mm-hmm. see that coming. <laughs> yeah, that was brutal. Yeah, that's another parallel with like Psycho, um, the whole the fake out where um, she gets killed in the shower and Psycho, she's your main character half for like half of the film and then it switches who your lead character is, was trying to do here because Franklin really is who we're focused on prior to that point. I mean, yeah. the first shot we see of the group is him outside trying to use uh, the restroom yeah. on the side of the road. He was using a can by the side of the road. I, d- I didn't catch why why that would happen. The pull over. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, you just pee on the ground. Like, uh, <laughs> if you're already pulled over. But anyway. Um, but yeah. That was parallel to Psycho again. Yeah. But um, if I may, um, talking about the horror significance, I think one of the first times we talked about it being a slasher in those tropes, I think it was one of the first times in horror where they really made the monster or the villain like very American, like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, where before it was like a mystery thriller or it was like vampires or something, where it was like a foreign entity, like with cultural things at the time, like World War II. And now this was like the Vietnam War and the civil unrest and all that. So they made it like um man american is is also the problem man is the problem more than some foreign idea well yeah because you're saying like um the way that like the way that the industry was like advancing in technology like the the way that they're like oh it's better when you kill them kill the cows with the sledgehammer instead of with the gun Mm -hmm. because like a people it took because like it was very close to home to his family because like they're all butchers that would you know the only thing I could think of is like, if you watched uh, Stephen King's eleven twenty two sixty three or whatever on uh, Hulu, right. the, um, 
they actually like had a guy that did that. Like he would like took a sledgehammer to the cow to kill it. Like that's like how they did it back in the day. I'm like, oh shit, that's like really fucked up. <laughs> mm, that's funny. Mm-hmm. Yeah, until they got the the bolt. Yeah. Man. Yeah, which is a another point of this movie. It's very pro pro vegetarianism. If you. <laughs> I was surprised that that they had a character that kind of was like against you know the killing of animals. Like I mean, yeah, that was pretty early. Like Peta wasn't around then. No, but like I think what this movie did well is hit a lot of issues because I feel I mean seventy four was when it takes place, but like the end of the sixties was so culturally so much. I mean, it was so many movements. That's when the women's movement started the civil rights movements, the environmental movement, which goes in hand in hand with like vegetarian movement. Yeah. Vietnam was happening. So it's this huge unrest, um, in what's happening in society. So I think it just tried to hit on a lot of those, those issues in one movie Mm -hmm. as much as it could. And it's, it's interesting that it was able to do that without feeling like like, too much. Cause it's like, there's a lot of movies that take on a lot of shit and it's just like, you're overcrowding yourself right now, but you know, even though they talked about that stuff, it it's this movie wasn't about that. It was just like conversation amongst the characters, and that was that. It wasn't like a a meeting for the movie. It was just like kind of like a side note. It was like kind of like just a talking point, not like a an overall message. I would agree with that. Right. Yeah. I think that's what helps to make it work. Mm-hmm. Um. But yeah, I mean. But this kind of, you know, as we touched on being the first of its kind, I think uh, it kind of paved the way, you know, there are definitely certain elements that we recognize in slashers, whether it was in the 70s or whether, you know, they're coming out today. Like, you know, like with the weapons, like you said, like they don't really use guns ever. They're going to use like more like blades or chainsaws or like just in general, like blunt objects. Um, that's Mm -hmm. definitely something that I, um, that's, you see, um, as we touched on before, there's, you know, one, usually one female survivor or their final girl, everyone else, you know, kind of meets their end. And then, uh, with the teenagers, you know, kind of being far away from help too, you know, that, uh, which is, Mm -hmm. of course, that led them to, you know, their circumstances. But those are like three, uh, elements that, um, I think are pretty prevalent in any slasher you'll see today or, you know, any of the ones that follow uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'd agree. And, and, and not just the slasher genre, I'm thinking more of, like, still horror significance. I'm not sure if it's the first one, but it's definitely up there. The idea of the true events documentary style. Mm-hmm movie like it, no one really has a camera per se like they're not filming themselves but that's how it's presented i mean there's the crawl at the beginning that like this happened on august 18th 1973 mm-hmm. is what it says and there's these radio reports of what's happening um i think that drew a lot of people to it yeah yeah I, definitely and but i feel like if <laughs> they would have done their math at all like by the time they saw it it was like less than a year when they said the events happened and all they'd have to do is like double check, but true. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, well, they didn't have the internet then, so you can't blame them too much. Yeah. Oh, okay. go, go to the library and check yeah. those old archives. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe we had that on its side then. Yeah. I thought it was true up until I like did some research and found out that it was not true except for the, I, I guy thing. Um, obviously that was drawn from, real life circumstances um but yeah i i wouldn't have known like i wouldn't have even thought about it i was just like oh shit this is real Mm -hmm. yeah and uh toby hooper said he pulled also from well ed gein or gein but also this other um serial killer that was in texas i believe because he was in working at the university of texas when he came up with this idea of this other serial killer who basically like owned up to everything 
he had killed several people, but he was like, I'm going to take whatever you give me like I did this. And he wanted to put that in the characters of like this moral schizophrenia of like people who would commit these crimes knowingly, but also had a moral conscious sort of a thing with like the family knew what they were doing, like this family knew what they were doing, um, but continued anyway. So that's an interesting process. Wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I'm saying. Yeah. Well, then... <laughs> I just want to know, like, what makes them... I know it's, like... That's, like, what ruins, like, the sequels of the Texas Chainsaw. That they, like... They go deeper into the family. Which is, like... Interesting, but it's always, like, ruined. Because, like... (laughs) Because, like, I mean... Uh, two... You go into Texas Chainsaw 2 and it's, like, more comedy. It's more, like... Over the top... It's gorier, the poster is even parodying The Breakfast Club, mm-hmm. and then you go into three, and it's a reboot or some shit, and four is another reboot. It's like, they, they, they like, change the timeline so many times, they change family members, it's hard to keep track of it all. Yeah. And then they fucking actually, like, do a hard reboot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, there's eight of them. Well, there's gonna be eight of them. Um... I don't know if you guys know this. Leatherface is a movie that comes out October 2017. It is a, uh, it's another prequel in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Are you going to see it? Uh, probably. Uh, I probably will, but I don't think it's going to theaters. It's just like a, I don't even know who's producing it, but. Wait, you don't think it's going to theaters? I don't think so. I haven't seen anything about it except like I just did some research on it. I've seen. Yeah. This is the first time I'm heard surprised. Of it. I saw the Red Band trailer, and I could have sworn that like this seemed like the kind of movie that would go into theater. Like this is the way it was like presented. Well, um, because like the last Texas Chainsaw Massacre was so was like even though maybe not critically acclaimed, financially made a shit ton of money. Yeah, they all do. And they all make so much money. Yeah, they do. They make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. And they all make it for really cheap, and then they just make a shit ton of money. They just, re- just release it around Halloween, and it makes mm-hmm. a lot of money. <laughs> Must be doing something, right? What was the last one? Was it 2006? It was the 3D or one. Or more recent than that? I think it was like 2011 yeah, or something. That's the I want to say 13. Right there. <laughs> let, me, let me look. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, 2013, you're right. Texas Chainsaw 3D was ah. in 2013. 2006 was before that. That one's the beginning. And then before that was the remake, which is in 2003, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That was the beginning of the reboot cycle. Right on. But it's weird. It's because 3 and 4 are... They also change the timeline. Mm-hmm. But, like, consider them sequels. It's really fucking it weird. Is. Yeah. Like... Because... And there's, like, conspiracies, and there's, like, Illuminati, and then, then there's, like, aliens. It's, like, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I like the sound of that. That's too complicated. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the fourth one where Matthew McConaughey is involved, and uh, s- some other Say no famous actor. Ac- Renee Zellberger, I think. is, is that the, That's the beginning, right? That's, that's, like, the first prequel one they did? Not, not no. 3D, right? No, this is Texas Chainsaw 4 well, that came out in the 90s. Oh, The Next Generation. Tex- yeah. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. Okay, gotcha. Yes, that's Matthew McConaughey and Renee Zellweger, mm-hmm. where it, uh, the family is involved with the Illuminati that is controlled by aliens or some shit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to guess that Hooper was not involved with all of these. He Was he? He got a nice paycheck, out. though. He's telling <laughs> He was part of the first two. He wrote and directed the first one, and the second one he just directed. And then he's n- not right. been attached since. I can handle that. Yeah. But Kim Hinkle has been on the first, second, uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So six of the eight Kim Hinkle has been attached to, and Kim Hinkle was one of the original writers with Toby Hooper. 
So the first one, Kim Hinkle wrote with Toby Hooper and directed the second one and The Next Generation, Pete. <laughs> So the okay. original, I don't know why the original such writer a hater. I haven't seen all directed these. and wrote that one. <laughs> I guess there's some trend that we missed in the 90s that had to do with aliens that they wanted to capitalize on. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, oh, how can so. we make this different? Mm-hmm. Fucking aliens, let's do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the Illuminati. But Gunnar Hansen was only in the first one as Leatherface. I feel like he's a fairly popular name. Attached to Leatherface, but he didn't. He was never Leatherface ever again. Yeah, it's not like the guy who did uh, Jason, where there's like, I mean, the or f- Freddy. It was, or Freddy, obviously, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's weird because the guy who's famous for doing Jason did him in the later ones. <laughs> like he did it. Um, I think he did like five movies as Jason, but like the last like five. Like okay. it was like, it was like f- like. Three, I think it was like four, five, six, and seven that he did, or something like that. And he's like a big dude. I can't remember his name. Yeah, I can't either. But mm. but he's supposed to be a real cool guy, and real, the real fans neat, love him. Real neat guy. Yeah. Hmm. That's good. I'm glad he has a personality. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, um, and and uh, when you're a mindless monster, you gotta have some personality. That's right. You gotta, you gotta you know balance what? that cool demeanor you have when you're a psychotic killer. Matt. Yes, Pete. <laughs> this is your favorite horror film, am I right? Yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's definitely up there, if not number one. Mm-hmm. Cause I remember you used to have, I remember you used to have your cover photo as the girl. Sally Hardesty? Truck at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. You had that one for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's one of my favorites. Um, and we did. What particularly? No, sorry. I was. Like, I, I think I can answer I your like, question, but. <laughs> yeah, I was like, what particularly resonates it for you? Yeah, definitely. Um, um, and just to start that, earlier in a mini episode, me and Pete did about famous directors or producers. Pete can attest, I almost did Toby Hooper, um, but I chose Val Luton instead because I didn't think many people knew who that was. Um, but this one really resonates with me um, for several of the reasons we talked about. It really started the slasher genre and when those things didn't exist prior. Um, and it do- it's an exploitation film um, to some extent. Um, it's not too gory, but yet it makes you feel so uncomfortable. And it's just so densely packed, I think, with thematic elements. that it- And it doesn't like hit you in the head as we kind of talked about. It's very subtle. Um, Definitely with, like, industrialization and the family and, like, the nuclear family. Um, the ideas of that shattering at the time. Um, the Vietnam War. All those things, I think, have elements in this movie that are resonated through certain characters. And um, also in thematic elements that I really liked. I thought was a good film touch. Um, are you guys familiar with Salvador Dali's The Persistence of Memory? The painting? With the melting clocks? Oh, yeah. The melting yeah. clocks. Well, there's a... A great shot in this film where they've been there at the grandfathers and it's Kirk and Pam. They they're out trying to find the swimming hole and it's right before they meet Leatherface's house and they see this tree with a bunch of clocks on it. Nailed to the nailed to the tree hanging. Yeah. Yeah. And the idea of the persistence of memory is just like it freezes time. Um you're going into a timeless era, so you're kind of like they're walking into this zone that is like a nightmare, is timeless, sort of it stops time from existing, um, and that's when they see that tree, and it's just a, it's a quick little shot, which I just think is a very um, interesting film take, um, as well as the whole zodiac thing. I don't have to go into a deep message about that, but she was talking about how Saturn's in retrograde. Yeah, yeah. And they keep they yes. have the cinematography of the sun and the moon constantly. They're showing that, you know, they have the the and the solar the solar spots are in the opening credits. Um, and if I may, I got my little book here. Um, <laughs> um, when Saturn's in retrograde, it foreshadows the literal Saturnalia, I believe it is, which is the patriarch slaughter and consumption of the children that the movie depicts. And the Zodiac connects with the unnatural tinted sun in the opening credits, which come after shots of corpses and suggests the universe itself is against this group. 
So just from those opening shots, you can kind of pick up on what's going to happen to these people. So I just think it's really dense and it doesn't, like they, the characters aren't talking about it um, and it's still terrifying and people still um, love this movie as a icon in slasher horror too. So it's commercially, I think, great and critically is why it's a favorite of mine. It hits. And that's why you defend it. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to destroy this movie. No, I completely defend it. <laughs> it's it's too good that I, I just, I just want to see it go. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Lindsay, I want to hear what you have to say. Are we officially going into Defend or Destroy? Or? I would say so, Let's since uh, Matt had a nice little spiel about his. I want to hear, I right. want to hear yours. Let's go. Um, I agree. I think this movie is completely iconic in the history of filmmaking um and no other remake or sequel will ever match that i don't care if the writer of the original is attached to all these other (laughs) ones i mean i I really should stop hating so much because i haven't exactly watched these but like whatever um i two thumbs up from this kid i hadn't actually seen it until we watched it in that horror class like "Mm." It's probably going on four years now, I think. Um, and, like, in that class, like, I would, like, fall asleep a lot because, you know, I'd had a long day. And I never fell asleep when we were watching this movie. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, there was, like, so much, like, action-packed. Like, I noticed that it was less about dialogue in this movie. And it was more, which, you know, there was a good amount of that. Um, but it was really, you know, the quick pace, um, you know, and kind of, like, Pete had mentioned before, kind of the lack of music that set up, you know, what was about to happen, you know, since there wasn't any of that, it made it creepier for me. Um, So, yeah, I'm going to give it five stars all around. Yeah, I really liked it, and I think uh, it did a good job kind of paving the way for all the slashers to come. Mm Mm-hmm. So, Peter, what I you destroy think? this movie. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> all right. I, like, I mean, no, I, I can't. I mean, I. It's not my favorite horror movie, you know, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to destroy it. <laughs> I can't. I can't. You know, knock. I, it's like obviously very influential in it in the film. I actually like rewatching it. Like, I I wasn't as scared on like. As I thought I would be. Um, but that's fine. It's because I've seen it already. And I knew what to expect. Um, but I one thing I did really like, uh, like on this rewatch was that this like setting the scene. Um, has mise-en-scene or whatever the, what was the word for it? <laughs> yeah. Mise-en-scene or something? Uh, I hear, was right, that right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just like, I mean, the... Especially when in the house where it's just like the when you first go into that room with all the chicken feathers and there's bones everywhere and then there's like that weird like sofa or something that's just like all bones. Yeah. And it's like I, I think that like that their creation of that is like really awesome and like it really like makes it like a place like you've never seen before. Like there, this is like a true like hell on earth. Like uh, because it's like everything is like different. There's no like room that looks the same. Like even though a lot of rooms have bones in it, they're just like crafted in a different way that makes it interesting. And I don't know why I was like so gravitated toward this watch, but I, I really appreciated this time around more than other aspects. I don't know why I also gravitated to it, though. <laughs> huh. mm-hmm. Great. Sorry. Um, and if I may, um, just before we go, talking about the cultural impact and the influence it had, um, just some people who have given credit to it laying the foundations for like their franchises was Carpenter's Halloween. The Evil Dead said Texas Chainsaw Massacre um, inspired them to make that movie, The Blair Witch Project. Ridley Scott uh, explicitly said the idea for Alien came to him after watching it and Rob Zombie's House of a Thousand Corpses. Um, so there are a few that people in interviews said that's how they got the inspiration for this movie was through the te- original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. So you heard it from the directors nice. first that this one really inspired them. 
it's a shame that um, it, it this was like his first movie, and it was just so culturally relevant and inspirational for other horror films that I almost feel like he was like too shy to come. Like he he directed movies, but not that much, um, mm-hmm. and didn't and couldn't match the success of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, which is kind of a bummer that your first one out is like the greatest project that you ever will release. <laughs> yeah. That's true. I don't think anybody wants that. And like that. the yeah. second one, you know, people may like it, just couldn't match it. And then there's other films like Poltergeist was decent. Yeah. Not as su- supreme as this one, but I definitely like that one a lot, but uh, like I would say some would argue that Spielberg had more of a hand than Hooper probably did. Uh, sp- Spielberg, Spielberg. You could. That's a Spielberg movie for sure. You could tell. What I'm picking a fight on Spielberg and on the Records podcast. Overrated. I, I'm just kidding. I'm Ooh. just kidding. He, he, will, he will destroy you. He will Fighting destroy words. you. Yeah. He'll shut down the podcast. Get him. I mean, he probably will. He probably won't even make a horror movie ever again. I feel like he's like out of that. Yeah. It's not the '80s anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay, so. We didn't really talk too much about the scene where Sally's tied up at like the dinner table with the family, um, which is the hitchhiker, the man at the gas station, and Leatherface, and they're creepily like laughing at her, and she's tied up, and then Grandpa comes downstairs, which is like this decay- <laughs> decaying person, um, sen- essentially a corpse. Um, but this film is notorious for filming in the middle of summer in Texas, where it was really humid, so everybody was like sweating, and it was like. St- they're, like Leatherface was like Gun- Gunner Hanson. They said was like smelled terrible because he couldn't change his shirt because it was dyed. So he was like sweating this for like days. Um, and on top of that, it took like eight to ten hours to do Grandpa's makeup for that scene. So the guy said, "I'm doing it in one shot." So they huh? for thirty six straight hours shot that scene until they got it. Oh my god. Um, that sounds terrible. Yeah. So some things happened while they were doing that. Um, they cut Sally's finger um, for Grandpa to suck, essentially, which is one of the weirdest scenes in this movie. But since they wanted to do it in one take, then they couldn't get the tube of blood on the knife to, like, squirt blood. They had to cut her finger her, like, in fran- real life. They, so, yeah, the, the scene you see with her finger being cut on in the movie is her actual finger being cut. Um, yeah. <sighs> mm-hmm. Yeah. That's a little tidbit. Uh, production notes of Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and there's plenty more. Just listen to the <laughs> the uh, the commentary with Toby Hooper and Gunnar Hansen. <laughs> How dare you steal my last name? What? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think with that we uh, we've talked your ear off. At least I know I have with my my adoration of this movie. So I apologize, everyone. <laughs> But thanks for tuning in. And, uh, you know, we're on, we got a website. Let us know what you're thinking. If you hate this episode, let us know. Let us know what you want to hear. Because we want to hear from you, our loyal listeners. Um, we're on Twitter and Facebook. Um, anywhere you want to hear from us. Um, and that's about it for now. So, as always, I'm Matt Johnson. And I remain in the shadows. <laughs>